the end, I want to discuss with you what your opinion is of this uh, uh, event. Now, uh, Jack, I gave you some material uh, which you uh, have for the class, and I have some of the same material here. I'm going to pass this out. Will you all take just one sheet? And what this is, uh, it's going to be passing around the room now. This is the um, material which um, the um, translator of this book, Let History Judge, by Roy Medvedev, the same name as the current president of Russia, but a wholly different person. Um, this uh, translator wrote the introduction, and that's the material that you have. It's a short introduction. OK, so if you look at the material I passed out, you only need one sheet. It's only on one sheet. Those of you who are looking at it, it's on two sides. In some cases, it's on one side. And what you have is a list of reasons why the Soviet system collapsed, OK? This author has six reasons why the Soviet system collapsed. These may not be the total number. Put this away, and when we come to the last lecture, I want to return to what you have here. And I would like your ideas on why the system collapsed. Because there are six there, there may be 10, there may be 12 reasons. So we can talk about that. Okay. Uh, I want to just give you a brief outline of how this course will go. In this lecture, we will carry uh, forward from the um, time that Stalin was born until the revolution. The revolution, when I say that, I'm talking about February 19, 1917. The October revolution occurs halfway along, another eight months along in the year. I'll pick up from that point in the second lecture and carry us from the revolution to the conclusion of the Civil War. The Civil War, which was the aftermath of the revolution, took us up to the uh, 1920. Most of us here in America have little cognizance of the Civil War. We are very familiar with our own Civil War, which uh, resulted in a half a million deaths. In the Russian Civil War, the number of deaths were 10 million. It's a whole different story. OK, from the third lecture, I'll take up uh, Stalin's rise to power in the 20s and the struggle in the 20s, including the, um, uh, the Ukrainian famine and uh, what happened there. In the uh, fourth lecture, I'll take up the run up to, the, to the World War II, the tremendous amount of machinations between uh, Stalin's Russia and the uh, West, Britain, France, and Germany. In the fifth lecture, I'll take up the Second World War and what happened there and the uh, machinations between Stalin and the, big, and the uh, uh, Churchill and Roosevelt, the big three, and so on, and the amazing um, actions of the uh, uh, German-Soviet uh, uh, of a struggle. And in the last lecture, I'll take up the Cold War and the um, run up to uh, Stalin's death. And then we'll discuss the uh, paper I've just handed out. OK, so that's a general outline of this course. Now, what I'd like to do to start off is talk about the end point. I want to talk now about Stalin's death. We'll start at the back, OK? So let's have a look. Let's see now. Uh, let me get out of PowerPoint. Uh, can I get out of PowerPoint and minimize? Let's get out of PowerPoint. And we're going to go back to uh, January 1952. Stalin goes for his annual checkup. We're seeing this movie? Yeah. We got to see a movie now. You got it? Oh, there it is. He's Angina.
Your blood pressure is dangerous. Low pressure is high. As little work as possible. No injections. He has his own remedies. It's what they told Lenin. He's worried because that's the same thing they told Lenin. I'll tell you who it is. There's no voice at this point. But there he is. This is him. <laughs> OK. OK. Uh, so that's Dr. Winogradoff. Winogradoff is telling him that um, he's got to take it easy. He's been working like a dog. So Winogradoff tells him, I, I just need that screen. Winogradoff tells him that um, he's sick. Uh, and uh, he's very, very nervous about this. Stalin doesn't want to hear this, right? And you saw what happened. He went to the door, watched what the doctor is doing. Uh, just a word about Lenin. Lenin was sick for about a year and a half, or almost two years. And he, you'll see some photographs later on in, in, the in the next lecture about the lousy condition that uh, Lenin uh, deteriorated. He had suffered from stroke. And uh, this is very, very scary to, uh, to Stalin. Shortly thereafter, as a matter of fact, by December 1952, Winogradov, this doctor, is in Lubyanka prison. Okay. Also in the prison are a whole group of Jewish doctors. That's the beginning of the Jewish doctor plot, the so-called Zionist plot that uh, was boiling in Stalin's mind at that time. And it was going to be very bad for the Jews of Russia. It was going to be very bad for Russia itself, for Soviet Union itself. Okay, so that was, 19, that was uh, through 1952. So let's move forward now to um, January 1953. Uh, by this time, Stalin has fired uh, Vlasic, who had been with him his, almost his entire career. Vlasic was his uh, major domo, uh, was like his um, uh, office manager. Uh, Vlasic, of course, he was stealing like all, uh, uh, like all bureaucrats in that position. And uh, Stalin accused him of it, and he was now in jail someplace. Uh, his secretary, Prospevnikov, was also in jail. Molotov and uh, Mikoyan, who were old-time comrades, were no longer had any ministries, although they were still in the Politburo. He was cooking up this doctor's plot. He was coming back to another purge. They were all feeling it. Khrushchev was on the Politburo at the time, and um, Barrier, of course. But what had happened was um, Barrier's second in command was no longer Barrier's um, uh, client. It was now Khrushchev's client, a guy named Ignatiev. So everything was in flux here. And Svetlana had moved out of the DACA. She was no longer living with her father, but that was that was an ongoing thing of fighting with his daughter over, over the years. So actually, Stalin had nobody around him that had been his longtime uh, comrades. And he had the, uh, uh, so let's move forward now to Saturday night, February 27th, 1953. OK, this is a guy, this is Stalin. He, uh, he's a night hawk. He sleeps late in the morning. He eats dinner at 10 or 11 o'clock at night. He stays up till the middle of the morning. And he calls his comrades around. Uh, from what I'm going to tell you now, you can get some of it from this book, Conversations with Stalin by uh, Milovin Dijas from the Yugoslav uh, Communist Party. Uh, Stalin, he, he recounts a, a dinner with Stalin where he went over, he was invited, one of the few foreigners who was invited to the DACA. Get to the DACA and uh, 
pretty soon they're drinking. They're all drinking. And uh, he knew later that Stalin would serve him vodka, but he had a um, Georgian wine that looked like vodka. So he would serve you vodka, but he's drinking white wine. Okay, and he likes to get you drunk because he figures if you're drunk, he can find out the truth. He find, you'll talk if you're drunk. So he's doing this trick. And the other trick is you have to figure out, you have to say how cold it is outside in centigrades. So if you make a mistake, uh, if, it's, um, if it's 15 centigrades and you say 17 centigrades, then you have to have two shots of vodka. If you say 20 centigrades, then you have to have five shots of vodka. So that's the trick to get you to drink. Beria used to deliberately make mistakes because he was a drunk. <laughs> Okay, so they're out there, they're having this uh, dinner, and the people around the dinner are uh, Khrushchev, McCoyan, Beria, and um, I can't, why can't, I'm, I'm having a senior moment here. The last guy, it'll come back to me. No, no, okay, so they're, they're, they're drinking, and uh, they go to see a movie, and um, finally, it's about 3 o'clock in the morning, and it's time to go home. They say goodnight to Stalin. He punches Khrushchev in the stomach. He says, Nikita, he's fooling around with him. Now, the next morning comes, Sunday morning, February 28, 1953. 10 o'clock rolls around. He's not up. 11 o'clock rolls around. He's not up. 12 o'clock, he should get up by now. The guards are getting nervous. 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock. And they don't want to go in. Nobody wants to bother with him, because if you bother him, he's not a guy to fool around with, right? And remember this about Stalin. He's the most powerful man, probably, in the history of the world, has more power in his fingers than anybody ever had before him. And there's a hospital a quarter of a mile away. Keep that in mind. Finally, the mail comes in from the Kremlin. Somebody has to go in. So one of the guards who normally brings in the mail goes in at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and they find him on the floor. He's wet his pajamas, and he can't talk. So. They pick him up, and they put him on the couch, but they don't call the hospital. They don't call anybody but Beria. They start looking for Beria. They can't find him. They call Malenkov. That was the guy I couldn't remember. They call Malenkov. Malenkov says, don't bother me. Get a hold of Beria. And they start calling around, looking for Beria. Finally, um, they, they notify Khrushchev. They notify Bulganin. Khrushchev and Bulganin come out to the DACA, but they don't go in to Stalin. And it's getting later and later. This is 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock. Khrushchev has been hanging around the house because he figures Stalin's going to call him, so he's not going to have dinner because he's going to probably get called out to the DACA. But instead, he finds out about this, and he goes out there. But they don't go into the DACA. They go to the guardhouse. Boganin and Khrushchev confer in the dark house, in the guardhouse. They call Ignatiev, and they go back home. Finally, they get a hold of Beria. Beria comes out. It's about 10 o'clock at night. He goes in. He looks at Stalin, who's laying on a couch, and he says, "What are you bothering me for?" He's sleeping. He's sleeping, and they leave. Okay, and now it gets to be Monday morning. So this Stalin has been in this state since Sunday morning, sometime, let's say, 4, 5, or 6 o'clock in the morning. And now it's Monday morning, about 8 or 9 o'clock. They come back out, and now they call the doctors. And of course, it's too late by now. Uh, the doctors, there's very little that they can do. They call Svetlana at about 10 o'clock on Monday morning. She comes out. In her memoirs, she she says that um, the, do, uh, the, the, mecha, uh, the um, orderlies came with uh, machinery, but they couldn't get it working, and so on and so forth. And it's pretty much concluded that he's going to die. So they set up a uh, death watch 
uh, two of them at one time, and Molotov and Mikoyan are called back. They're a pair, Bolganin and uh, Khrushchev are another pair that they have a watch, and uh, Beria and Mikoyan have a watch. And this goes on until Thursday. On Thursday, um, he's, he's just about to die. He goes into some kind of a spasm, and he raises his arm. And they think he's going to get, he's going to come back to life. Beria goes down on his knees, starts kissing Stalin's hand. Oh, oh, comrade. Finally dies. Finally dies. At this point, Beria springs to his feet, orders his car, and zips back to the Kremlin, and immediately goes into Stalin's office, raffling through the documents probably destroying whatever documents was on his mind. Uh, they take Stalin's body out. The, as you probably all know, it was embalmed and put into the mausoleum, and it was uh, put next to Lenin's body. It was moved later, as, as you all probably know. When they were taking out the desk, there were found under a newspaper three letters which he kept over the years. One was a letter from Lenin, the next was a letter from Bukharin, and the last was a letter from Tito. As we go through the course now, as I come across the events that stimulated those letters, I'll remind you about them and tell you what they were and give you an idea of why he collected them. So that was the death of Stalin. It's amazing, a hospital only a quarter of a mile away, the most powerful man in the world, yet they were so afraid of him, so afraid of what he could do and what he, would, what he might do, that in effect, by either action or inaction, he was killed by his own people, hoisted on his own petard, if ever there was somebody who had that happen to them. OK. so. Any questions about this? Uh, in some of the biographies, as I have so, uh, several biographies here on the table, uh, one of them, uh, particularly this one, um, let me see where, where the, oh yeah, particularly this one by Edward uh, Rajensko, um, he believes that Beria deliberately poisoned him. He believes that uh, he was actually killed, uh, but uh, Stalin had uh, tasters and so on. Oh, by the way, I have here a bibliography for you. Again, you only need one sheet. It's certainly not a complete bibliography. Jack has one down for you folks down in... in uh, and who was the middle letter from? Between? The middle letter was from Bukharin. Bukharin was another one of his comrades who was killed in the purges in, 19, in uh, 1938. Um, he, he'll come up again. Bukharin was a very interesting guy. OK, so let's roll the tape back now. Let's go back to 1879. Stalin is born in Gori. And let's follow this story forward from there. Stan, we need the PowerPoint. Is it up? Yes. The Caucasus, the revolutionary. Do you have it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Okay. So, 1879 in, um, in Russia. Uh, his, mother is, uh, his mother is Ekaterina Jugashvili. That's his family name, Jugashvili. Uh, she had three children, but she weren't, they didn't survive. He's the only child that survived. Okay. His father um, is, uh, he doesn't write much about his father. Uh, we know this much about the father. He was uh, probably from Chechnya or that area. Coming down, if you look at the map, you see that Chechnya is just above Georgia. Comes over the Caucasus Mountains. He was a shoemaker. Uh, he briefly had his own business, and then he, um, he, he had to give it up and go to work for somebody else. And he went down to uh, uh, Tiflis, where, uh, um, where he then worked. Uh, at some point, he came back to Gori when Stalin was about eight years old and took him 
down to the factory, and he kept him there. He probably had him working in the factory uh, with uh, Vissarion. Uh, Stalin's name is Joseph Vizoranovich Jugasvili. Vizoranovich means son of Viz Vizarian, his father being Vizarian Jugasvili. J.V. Stalin, Yosef Vizoranovich. Okay, uh, at the time he was born, uh, Trotsky was born just about the same time, uh, and Lenin uh, had been born nine years earlier. Uh, you'll see from my note there that Le in Lenin's family, uh, his brother, his older brother, had been accused of uh, plotting the assassination of the Tsar and was hanged for that uh, uh, crime. Assassinations were going on in Russia throughout the 19th century. Tsar Nicholas II, the Tsar of our story, his father, his grandfather was assassinated. That was Tsar Alexander II, okay? Um, we'll talk about the Romanovs also in this uh, lecture, but the, uh, the killings of prime ministers, assassinations, they were going on throughout the time. Oh, he's going the wrong way. Oh, here's Stalin's mother, uh, Keki, uh, Svan, Svanadze. The, these names are all uh, Georgian names. Uh, the family were uh, sort of middle class people. What happened with her is once, once uh, Vizarian left, she was impoverished. She had to take in wash and so on. She was probably became a cleaning lady. And she prevailed upon the local priest to take her son, Yosef, known affectionately in the streets as Soso. Soso is like Joey. If your name is, is uh, Yosef in that part of the world, the uh, nickname for you would be Soso. So she got Soso into school by, um, through the local priest. And here's Stalin's father. Oh, no. Wrong father. That is his father. I guess that would be his father. He actually, you couldn't say that his real father was much of a father to him. So if there was any father, this is the father. All right, let's take a look at Gory itself. I've outlined it here. It's uh, down there off the, uh, uh, the Black Sea, uh, off in a corner. This is the part of the world, this is the, the, the hinterlands of the world. In the Greek world, this is where uh, the Argonauts went, the, the trailing all the way up to the end of, uh, of the world, so to speak. Um, let's get a closer look at this. Okay, you can see down there, Tbilisi is the um, uh, main uh, uh, city of the, of the area, now known as jo now Georgia, and Gori is a little town a little bit beyond it. The two uh, uh, towns on the water, you see Batumi there on the Black Sea, and you can see, oh yeah, I need this thing, yeah, that's what I need. Oh, this is really lousy. Get it there. Yeah, it's really lousy. Well, it's lousy on the screen, but not on the Okay, here. Here's Batumi, and here's Baku. Can you focus that in? No, I can't. The answer is I can't focus it. Uh, Baku is a center for oil. Okay, that's the Caspian Sea. There's still a lot of oil down there. I think we can get a little closer even. Yeah, there we go. Uh, Baku was a... Uh, a place where people were making a lot of money in the early 1900s. Um, Nobel was down there, the Nobel Company. Uh, the Rothschilds were down there with, a, with uh, an operation. And uh, you'll see later that Stalin in his uh, um, days as a revolutionary was traveling between Baku and Batumi, Batumi being the place where you shipped out the oil. Okay, um, organizing strikes and organizing workers. So this is the cockpit of his activity, this area of the Caucasus. Uh, if you look at the map today, this is Georgia. Okay, there's his hometown, there's his house, there's his little place where he was born. It looks like, um, like where Pinocchio was born, you know, the same kind of little, little hut. Okay. Can I get rid of that? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not, okay, there we go, okay, okay. Now, uh, his early childhood, uh, 
Presumably, there are a number of stories about why his arm was damaged, but he has a shorter arm. One arm is shorter than the others. And he's a short guy anyway. He's, um, he's shorter than me. Uh, he had smallpox. His face was all full of pock marks, and it never comes out in the photographs because all the photographs are airbrushed and fixed up. Um, the father, as I say, pulled him out of school. But this is what's interesting. Keki, his mother, goes running down to Tbilisi, and she, whatever she could do, she got him back. And back he went to Gori to get back into school. Uh, the mother always hoped that he would become a priest. And as a matter of fact, as you'll see in the next slide, he goes to the seminary. He graduates from the local school, and he's enrolled in the seminary in Tbilisi. This seminary has a history of producing more atheists than any other school. OK, now here's a picture of him at school. This is a very interesting picture to kind of um, uh, portend what uh, the person we're talking about. Um, here he is. That's Stalin. OK? So he's a short guy standing in the middle of the tall guys. He belongs in the front with the other short guys, but he's not. He's organized this picture. He organized this photograph. He got the whole thing together and put himself right there in the power position. And there's a, a close-up of the same, uh, of the person. OK? Now, in 1895, he gets to uh, the Tiflis, now called T Tbilisi. In those years, it was known as Tiflis. Uh, the Theological Seminary. Now, as I said, this was quite a place. Uh, a few years before him, the principal was assassinated by one of the students. And the reason for the assassination was the, um, the Russian Empire at that time were insisting that these students speak Russian and be taught in Russian. But there's a Georgian language. And the dispute was over Georgian nationalism. Nationalism was a key element of the struggle between the Georgian people and the Russian people at that time. It's interesting that um, Stalin became a Russian nationalist, although at this point he was a Georgian nationalist. Uh, there's a socialist organization in 1898. Um, when Marx wrote Das Kapital, it didn't get much circulation. And if any of you ever pick up and try to read Das Kapital, you'll know why it doesn't get much circulation. It's not a page turner. However, in Russia, it was soaked up. Their biggest audience for the book, the, the publishers of uh, Das Kapital, was in Russia. Because it, for some reason, the Russian people or the Russian intellectuals um, took to it. Uh, let's see. OK, so he's expelled for not attending examination. He's not thrown out of school. He just stops going. OK, it's not that they threw him out. And when he was there, he got, top, he got very good grades. And very interestingly, one of his best grades was in singing in the chorus. And throughout his life, he was known as a guy who could sing. He would always be um, able to sing and wanting to sing. And there was a lot of disappointment when they threw him out when he left because he was going to stay with the chorus. He worked for three months at the observatory, which involved uh, writing down the temperature and uh, recording the weather. And as far as that goes, this leader of the workers' paradise, this is the only quote unquote job he ever held for work. I mean, he had a lot of jobs in the government and so on. But as far as being a worker, this is the only worker work that he did. I know, I remember in Dr. Zhivago, they, want you to, they asked Zhivago, let me see your hands and see if he's a worker. Well, if it was Stalin and they looked at his hands, he wouldn't qualify as a worker. OK, and uh, he quits Tiflis in 1901. Now he's, become, now he's going underground. At this point, let's see, he was born in 1879. So by this time, he's 22 <coughs> years old. OK, and he's going underground. Why did the police raid his room? Well, he's, he's doing um, 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 union work. He's publishing. He's, he's, he's into the uh, 
the socialist agitation in that time, and, and, uh, and that's what they're after. Um, the Russian uh, Okhrana, the Russian uh, secret police, are trying to find every revolutionary, and they find him quite a few times, as you'll see. The Russian socialists, let's talk about them. They found the uh, party with only 12 people in 1898. The Russian Social Democratic Workers' Party. We're going to leave the Caucasus for a while just to get a background on what's going on with the, uh, with the uh, socialist movement. Okay? In 1900, there's a, uh, a copy of Iskra, the spark, in other words, to start the revolution. And uh, then there's this question of the split. Um, Lenin wants the membership uh, to be those who are really going to participate in revolution. And uh, the other part of the party wants to build a big party. They want a nucleus, but they want a uh, big party program. Uh, I'm going to hold up a book here. If I, I hope I brought it with me. Oh, yeah, right. Uh, Lenin, uh, pre uh, later on, I don't know if you can get this up on the screen, Lenin writes this book uh, around this time, a little bit after this. It's called, What is to be Done? This is the Boy Scout Handbook of Revolution. If you look through this book, he, he lays out the program for what it takes to uh, run a revolution. And uh, one of the things in here, if, uh, I probably can't find it because the light isn't so good, but it doesn't really matter. What's in here, he says, what you got to do is have a very disciplined organization. You have to obey the party leadership. You have to uh, be disciplined. And anybody who can't be disciplined has to be out of the party. And it goes on and on as you can see all these pages. What is to be done? So they have uh, uh, this um, conflict in the party. And they have this small wording as about who is, who is qualified to be in the party. In 1903, there's a Congress uh, in which this is um, uh, discussed. Now, at this Congress, <clears throat> this is where the word Bolshevik comes from. Okay? Bolshevik, in Russian, means the majority. So they are the Bolsheviks. Lenin and his group are the Bolsheviks. Menshevik in Russian, <coughs> excuse me, means the minority. Now, how did the Bolsheviks, the majority, come to be the majority? They had a vote about who would be on the board of the, um, of the paper. <coughs> but one of the uh, groups that would have been supported Martov, the, um, the opponent of Lenin, were the Russian Jewish Workers Bund. The Russian Jewish Workers Bund. Their program was um, autonomy for the Jews in uh, Russia. And they wanted Yiddish to be acknowledged as a national language. But Lenin was against that. And Martov agreed with them. They felt that it was workers of the world unite, and we don't want to encourage any more splitting into different national groups. So the Russian Jewish Workers Bund walked out of the meeting. And they would have voted with Martov. They would have voted against Lenin's program. But with those people gone, and the vote was then held, although Lenin's group was the minority in the party, for that moment, they were the majority. And so they were called the Bolsheviks. So in fact, the Jews of Russia, the Russian Jewish Workers' Party made Lenin the Bolsheviks, and they became known. Of course, it was a big advantage to be known as the Bolsheviks, because I, if given a choice, I would rather be the majority than the minority. OK, and this is another of the same thing. If you see there, uh, uh, Lenin proposes that the party members accept the program, support the party, and uh, belong and be active. And Martok says, you don't have to belong. All you have to do, you can belong, but all you have to do is agree with us. And do you know when those cartoons were made? These are from the, a, uh, a book. These are uh, modern cartoons. They're from this book, uh, Lenin for Beginners. And uh, you can, no, they're just, they're just modern, modern cartoons. 
Lenin for beginners. Okay. Lenin is the fanatic Robespierre, and Martov is the uh, Hamlet. Okay, so the party splits, and they are now called the Bolsheviks. Okay, now this is the difference between the two, as I explained before, uh, Mensheviks being more or less uh, liberal middle class, and Lenin being the, um, let's call them Russian jihadists, okay? Um, people that have made a, uh, a, a commitment. Meanwhile, back at the Caucasus, while this is all going on, Koba. Now, Stalin's first nickname was Soso. Now that he was underground, he took this name, Koba. Koba was a hero in uh, Georgian literature, a kind of um, Robin Hood. And so he adopted this name, Koba. Um, he's hunted by the police. He's, uh, he's arrested, and he's sent to uh, Novaya Uda. I'll show you where that is in Siberia. Um, but this is the first of many arrests. Um, between this time and 1917, Stalin is free as a free man only about 17 months in that whole period of time. Most of the time, between this point and 1917, he's in prison. But even in that 17 months, he's very active. In 1905, after he gets out of this escape, he, he escapes from this place. In 1905, he pulls off with a gang of, of, uh, of um, people in Tiflis, a bank robbery that reverberates around the world. The hall is over three million US dollars, but it's in rubles. They um, stage a, in a, uh, an attack on a um, carriage that was delivering uh, currency to the bank in Tiflis. They set off bombs in the square. They, na they grab the loot and run, run off with it. In the process, they kill over 20 people in uh, shooting and uh, running around. And it is a scandal because the Social Democrats had declared that they would not pull off these criminal acts. However, there was Stalin and his gang, under Lenin's orders, carrying this out. The money is, uh, is um, uh, delivered to uh, Lenin and then is circulated in Europe, uh, passing the hot money, becomes hot money. One of the, the man who eventually becomes the ambassador to America, Litvinov, Maxim Niklinov, is one of the uh, people who are distributing the hot money and is arrested and imprisoned for that uh, thing. <clears throat> so he's a pretty active guy. Um, where, is, uh, where is this place? It's over here. Where is, my, where is my, oh here it is. There it is. That's where they send him. He escapes from here. Now I want you to look at this thing. If you have an idea of how big Russia is, how does he get from where he starts off as an escape prisoner all the way back to the Caucasus nine months later? It's, well, he, gets, he has false papers. Uh, he works his way by hitchhiking on, on uh, carts all the way to um, uh, Krasno, Krasnoyark and uh, sneaks onto the Trans-Siberian Railroad, and he works his way back. Why is the, um, why am I losing it? Oh. Does everybody see it? Are we OK? OK. Let's have a closer look at that. I think we, yeah, yeah we have a closer look at where Novaya Uda is. There it is, Novaya Uda, all the way in the back of beyond. Now, this is the eve of the Russo-Japanese War. Uh, he gets back to Tiflis. The Russo-Japanese War, I don't know if we're going to get into that now. Let's see. There he, this is what he looked like in 1906. Um, kind of handsome, but also sort of menacing. These are his, this is his rap sheet. Take a look at this. 
Escape, escape, escape. They called him the doctor of escapology. Until finally, as you see back there, 1913, they send him to a place in Siberia where he can't escape anymore. And I'll show you where that is. It's just above the Arctic Circle. So if you're going to escape, it's not going to be in the wintertime. I can assure you of that. OK, and here are all the different places. Uh, you see where number seven is. That's his last stop. OK, and he can't get out of there. But all the others, he goes to jail, and he gets out. They pick him up again. He goes to jail. He gets out. They find him again. He goes to jail. They pick him up. And it goes on and on like that. One of my uh, last time I gave this class, somebody raised their hand and said, "Why didn't the uh, uh, Why didn't the uh, um, the czarist uh, government just kill him? That would have been the end of it." Of course, they didn't realize what he would become, nor does anybody know what was going to happen. Of course, so what difference would it have made? Now, these are the Romanovs. Let's say uh, a little word about them. Um, Nicholas I, that's the first uh, in this sequence, but before him was Alexander I, whose picture is not on here. Alexander I is the czar in Tolstoy's War and Peace. He's the czar who was in charge at the time of the Napoleon invasion. And he was a rather liberal guy. What was happening to Lenin at this time? At the time of Lenin, Lenin uh, at the time of, Lenin was still in Russia until we get to the revolution of 1905. After that, Lenin is uh, briefly in, um, uh, interned, and then he is out of Russia. And he, he, since, he stays almost to 1917 as an exile, either in Krakow or in Vienna or in some place outside of Russia. OK, uh, uh, Nicholas I uh, takes over when uh, Alexander I dies. And uh, at the day of his coronation, or right after that, um, there is a revolution among the gods. And the gods are massacred in the square before the Winter Palace. It's, they are known as the Decemberists. And they're remembered romantically throughout the 19th century as a failed attempt at overthrowing the, uh, the Tsarist regime. The next person up is Alexander II, who was a liberal. Uh, he is responsible for releasing the hold on the serfs and liberalizing the, uh, the czarist machine, the regime. However, he is killed by um, an anarchist. An anarchist bomb uh, throws a bomb into his carriage in uh, Petrograd, and he's killed to be replaced by Alexander III. Now, you can just look at Alexander III and look at his son, Nicholas II, and you can see a father-son relationship, which is probably um, typical, let's say. You have this mild-mannered Nicholas II and this really aggressive um, Nick Alexander III. And that pretty much sums up the relationship of these two Romanovs. Nicholas II was um, a kind of a wishy-washy kind of person. Uh, and there he is. But you might say a nice guy to know, but really not such a nice guy. OK? Um, OK, now this is, the, this is the Russian fleet. In 1905, in the Russo-Japanese War, um, the Japanese attacked um, Port Arthur and occupied Port, and they in, uh, invested, or they they laid siege to Port Arthur. The Tsar decided to relieve Port Arthur, but the, uh, the fleet were in the Baltic Ocean. So if you know your geography, to get from the Baltic Ocean to Port Arthur, you have to go halfway around the world. And that's what they did. They sent this fleet halfway around the world, 18,000 miles, a fleet of 46 ships, eight battleships. This picture shows the eighth battleship passing Singapore. These are gigantic ships. This is a gigantic fleet. The Japanese met them in the, in the waters between Korea and Japan, near an island of Tsushima. And they conducted a maneuver, which is known 
in, in uh, naval uh, uh, strategy as crossing the T. You have ships going in a line like this, battleships. And now you have another fleet that crosses the T like that. And as you know, these guns are here. And these guns are shooting at nothing. OK? So if you cross the T, what happens is if you get crossed, you get sunk. And the Japanese cross the T twice. Sometimes when you cross the T, you cross here. And you break up this fleet altogether so that they're not following the lead ship. As a result of this battle, the Russians lost all of their battleships. One battleship survived and was surrendered. But these gigantic ships that you see on that picture all went to the bottom of the ocean, plus the other, 40, or the other ships in the fleet. It was a tremendous defeat. The, the, the largest defeat in the history of naval warfare. I should tell you that the Japanese sent 100 ships against these 46. Many of them were torpedo boats. So this was a big blow to the Tsarist regime. And so a revolution was sparked, the failed revolution. <clears throat> Discontent was rampant in Petrograd. The police uh, had in their employee a priest who was supposed to infiltrate among the agitators. And this priest led a uh, group of people toward the palace. And uh, acting in a high-handed way, the uh, palace opened fire on, these, um, on the crowd. And that caused uh, more and more agitation. And so there was a great um, uproar. The Tsar called in one of his uncles, and he said he wanted the, uh, there was a, a choice. Either he would have to have a military dictatorship, or he would have to establish a parliament, or a Duma, as they say in Russia. So he asked his uncle to become the military dictator. Only in Russia could you have a story like this. The, the, the uncle pulls out a revolver and puts it to his heart and says, if you don't have a Duma, I'm going to shoot myself right now. I don't know if the story is true or not, but it does illustrate how crazy things are in Russia. But he did agree to having a Duma, and a Duma or a parliament was created at the time of the 1905 revolution. It's also the time when the, um, uh, this is again the 19, uh, Sunday, January 9th, 1905, um, he leads the crowd toward the palace and they open fire on the crowd. <coughs> OK? Um, and some of you have seen that movie, the uh, Potemkin, Eisenstein's movie, where they shoot from the uh, um, steps in, uh, in Odessa. That incident occurred, <coughs> um, excuse me, I say no water, but I'm, I'm OK. Uh, that uh, incident occurred in, uh, in and during the 1905 revolution. Down here on the Lower East Side, when the uh, immigrants, uh, were Russian for, uh, Jewish forebears heard about this revolution in 1905. There was great celebration down on Delancey Street when all of this was occurring. There were Soviets at the time. A Soviet means a committee. Committees were formed all over Russia to uh, support the revolution and support these ideas. The chairman of the Soviet in Petrograd was Leon Trotsky, who was a young lawyer at the time. <clears throat> Lenin, who was out of the country, could not get back in time to participate in the 1905 revolution. <clears throat> it's my own theory, and I'll bring it up again when I talk about the, 19, the October Revolution of 1917, that uh, Lenin's motive to uh, instigate the October Revolution was partly based on his realization that he could not get here in 1905 in time to participate. And that if you don't get there in time, if you don't strike in time, you lose the opportunity. And so this uh, 
this uh, revolution ended with the establishment of a Duma. <clears throat> Am I going backwards or forward here? Yeah, I'm going forward. Limited reform, the establishment of a Duma, but shortly thereafter, in the, uh, in the years following this, uh, these events, they um, dismissed the Duma, they reduced the, the powers of the Duma, and in the end, by 1917, the Duma had very little power. But, of course, there was a revolution in 1917, and the Duma and the revolution accumulated a lot more power, and this did not work. But the, the Tsarist regime held them down in this period. Okay? Now, what was going on with Stalin? In 1906, he's now, he's pretty much a, an underground guy. He marries um, Ket, Ketivan, Kiki. He marries Kitivi Svanidzi. This wedding takes place in the middle of the night with just a few people because any minute the Tsar's police will catch up with him and he has to get on the lam. By a year later, his son Yaakov is born. And Soon after that, Ketavan dies. He says to somebody at the graveside, my heart has turned to stone. I'm now stone because I loved her so much. His second wife dies too. We'll talk about what happened to her. So his son, Jacob, is raised by Ketavan's brother. During the purge, Ketavan's brother is killed by Stalin's uh, regime. Uh, the son never gets the father's um, approval. Uh, Jacob grows up in his uncle and aunt's house. He eventually moves into uh, with Stalin and his wife. Uh, he enlists at the time of the fascist invasion. He's captured and there are pictures of him in a German prison camp. A message comes through to Stalin for exchanging Jacob for a uh, German general, and Stalin refuses. And Jacob is killed in the German, uh, on, being held by the Germans. Which war? Second war. Second war, 1907. He's too young for the first one. Uh, these are his travels. This is the only time before World War II that he goes out of uh, the country. Uh, all of these travels are done um, secretly with forged papers. Um, he goes to Finland, to Stockholm, he goes to London. Um, he, has, he gets into a fight. Uh, he and uh, Litvinov get into a fight with some uh, longshoremen in, um, in London. He, um, and then there's some memoir of some kid who was running errands for him, some English kid who was running errands for him, said he was a very good tipper. Uh, it's, I mean, a lot of these guys, they end up outside of Russia. Um, Trotsky, for example, ends up in the Bronx. Um, talking about tipping is why I remember this. Trotsky felt that it was an insult to tip, so he never tipped any waiters because he thought it was an insult to the working class to tip the waiters. So, that was his solution to uh, his working class uh, allegiances. And he goes to Krakow and he goes to Vienna in 1912. When he's in Vienna in 1912, at the same time that he's there, Hitler is in Vienna, living in a flop house someplace. And also working as a mechanic in Vienna at this time is Tito. Of course, these three people never meet each other, but they're all in the same town at the same time. Um, Stalin is sent to Vienna by Lenin. He goes to Krakow, and Lenin wants him to write a paper on the national question. Uh, the, Russia is an, an area with many nationalities, Georgia being one of them, the Jews being another, but the Poles, the Finns, you can go on and on with different kinds of people. And so they felt it was important to address this matter, and Lenin asked him to address it, very important question. But, um, Stalin could not read German, so he sent him to Vienna to work with Bukharin. Bukharin was another socialist at the time who was living in Vienna, and Bukharin helped him write or helped him translate the, um, uh, the German papers that he needed. 
He writes, Lenin, he writes to uh, Gorky, uh, as to nationalism, we're applying ourselves to the question, and we have found a uh, wonderful Georgian to write it. And uh, th that is what uh, Stalin's uh, reputation in the party is established by this, uh, at this point. I just want to make a couple of comments about Stalin and, and the party. Stalin's uh, activities in the Caucasus were mainly in this robber uh, uh, shakedown operation. He would get money from the robbery that I just described, but he also got money by threatening rich people, you know, threatening to kidnap them or kidnapping. It's an old story, right? So that was a kind of roughneck reputation that he had. At one of the party conferences, one of these that I showed you, he wanted to make a theoretical point. And some guy says to him, come now, Koba. Calm down, Koba. Everybody knows that theory isn't your strong point. He hated that. He hated those intellectuals for talking to him like that. This particular guy, luckily, was so old that he died before Stalin became a power, because it would have been too bad if he had survived that long. Marxism and the national question. OK, so here's his, uh, his rap sheet as you see what's going on. And then his last, the last place in 1912. In 1912, he's done all these escapes. He's in Petrograd. There's a guy in the party named Malinovsky. Stalin wants to go to a, um, a meeting. There was a meeting for International Women's Day. And uh, he asked Malinovsky, Is it you think it's safe for me to go? Malinovsky is an underground agent of the Okhrana, of the Tsarist police. Malinovsky says, sure. Naturally, he goes, and what do you know, he gets nabbed. He tries to escape by putting on a woman's coat, but they, they catch him anyway, and off he goes to this place. Where is this place, anyhow? There it is, number seven on this map. I think I have some close-ups. Yeah, oh, I guess I don't. Uh, you can see it's pretty up there. Number seven up there. It's just above the Arctic Circle. Here's a letter that he writes. I've got some sinister cough along with worsening freezes, 37 degrees below. I don't have wealthy relatives or acquaintances. I have absolutely no one to turn to. I'm appealing to you, not only to you, but to Trevskosky and Beyerdev. And he's looking, he's begging for money. He's begging for some, um, uh, from some clothing. People send him clothing. But he's there for four years. He doesn't escape from there until the revolution breaks out. But he remembers his stay in Siberia as a happy time, ice fishing, and um, enjoying the summertime. There are some pictures here of, um, oh yeah, this is an interesting picture. Notice the blank spot on this picture. This is a summertime conference. There's Stalin right next to the blank spot. Why is there a blank spot? I should have brought, I'll bring it next time. I have a book at home, which the title is The Commissar Vanishes. These are public pictures that were circulated through the press. But then he had purges, and he killed people. The blank spot is where one of the people he killed used to be. This is the original picture. That, you see, there was a guy there. That guy is Kamenev. Kamenev was his buddy, but he was gone. And then there's a further picture as more people are, are eliminated, and that's what it looks like. And there's a whole series of pictures like this where people disappear, and they not only disappear from the world, they disappear from the photographs. It's something that you could have found in 1984 about changing um, who controls the past controls the future. Or looking at this whole subject that we're talking about, I want to remind you of something that William Faulkner once said. The past is not dead. It's not even past. It's not even past. The events that we're talking about here they're not really gone. They are still there in the current Russia, in the current world that we live in. The jihadists of today have some things to learn 
or have learned from what is to be done. Am I just about out of time? Am I about five minutes? All right, I, I'll pick this up. Let me wind down and just get some questions before we run totally out of time. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 she's, uh, I forgot whose girlfriend. I think she's Ferdloff's girlfriend, uh, if I remember. But she took up with him, too. Uh, I forgot her name now, but she, this is Ferdloff over here. Uh, he became the president of the Soviet Russia. And he and, he and Stalin shared a cabin together, uh, briefly. So she's, she's also interned. People were sent up to Siberia. And you didn't need a prison like we had now. You had this built-in prison, Siberia. Of course, when he became in power, he established the Gulag. And people didn't escape from the Gulag as easily as he did all his escaping. But that's because he was a doctor of escapology. And that's why he was able to do that. Any other questions? Any questions down there in Great Barrington? You guys OK down there? Yeah. OK, OK, good. They seem to be. The natives are, re are not restless. OK. Yes, they're in prison. They're in, they're in exile or prison. Right. And they were allowed to meet. And he was allowed to have his books. And you could send him goodies and so on and so forth. The only thing was it was very hard to get there. If you just try to go, it would be difficult. No, no, this is in 1912. The question was, is this in prison? So the questioner wants to know, is this really a prison? It looks like summer camp. Mosquitoes are very tough. They're very big mosquitoes in this part of the world. But yes, uh, what else I want to say about this? Yeah, uh, this, the, they go to visit him in the wintertime. There's a story about somebody going to visit him. They go on reindeer sleds. It takes them all day to get from a small camp. Let me go back a little bit. Um, let's go back to the map. OK. Uh, I never know if I'm going to see the hair. Right. Here he is. He's up here in this little town. To get from this town, uh, this is really crappy, to get, from, to get from this town to here, it's an all-day journey on a reindeer-pulled sleigh uh, along, the, uh, along the river, on the frozen river. But he was happy. He was a big fisherman. He had a dog. He, uh, and he remembers, uh, when he says in the, in the opening uh, film, I have my own remedies, he had a remedy of cold baths. And that's what he liked to do. And also drinking iodine. I don't know what the hell, why that is any good for you. But um, he, um, he says to the doctor, if you remember that film that we ran, he says, I have my own remedies. And he picked up remedies from this uh, period. OK, I guess I have a little time. I can go a little bit more into this uh, material. This is the trade union picture in 1911. What's interesting about this is the size of the Russian Social Democrat trade union movement compared to the other countries of, of Europe. And as you can see, they have a tiny, tiny party. This tiny party compared to those other gigantic parties. Yet this is the party that made the revolution, and the others did not. Look at the size of the German party. Look at the size of the, of the, uh, of the uh, English party. The German party was led by Karl Liebknecht. Karl Liebknecht. Just an interesting story. About a year and a half ago, Sandra and I made a, a vacation trip uh, on our vacation through Eastern Europe. I have some pictures to show you. One of the pictures I'll show you, I took in East Germany, in Berlin. It was in front of a uh, mall, um, L&M or K&M mall, a clothing mall. There was a plinth. The plinth was put up by the East German government, never taken down by the new government of Germany, and a mall was created. There's no statue on the top of the plinth, but it was dedicated to Karl Liebknecht. And here is the ghost of Karl Liebknecht 
the German communist revolutionary in the middle of a mall looking at, uh, lo looking, the ghost looking over at all the construction and all the capitalist activity underway in Berlin today. So it's interesting to see how things have moved from the old days. Here's 1917, the war is on. As you see, the Cossacks are out on the street. There's a mutiny. Um, the Tsarist uh, regime is about to uh, tumble. The Duma is dismissed by the Tsar, but the Duma refuses to dismiss and asks the Tsar to resign. It's very simplified here, saying the Tsar resigned, but the Tsar tried not to resign. He tried to rally the army and send uh, troops in to suppress the revolution. It didn't work. There are various tricks. I'm running out of time. I can't describe what it was. But whatever it was, it didn't work. And he, uh, the Tsar abdicates in favor of his brother Michael. And next week, I'll bring in, uh, I have a copy of what happened to Michael. The actual last Tsar of Russia is not Nicholas II. It's, Mark, it's Michael. He abdicated not in favor of his son, who was suffering from hemophilia, but in, because he wanted to take care of his son, he abdicated in favor of his brother, Michael. But Michael refuses the uh, uh, crown. Uh, he, um, he says, uh, if the constituent assembly wants a czar, then I'll accept the crown. Well, one of the things that he said to those who were offering him the crown was, are you going to protect me? Are you going to protect myself? And as a matter of fact, as we know, the czar is assassinated. And so is Michael.